Hello, I'm uh, David Simpson, uh, 24 years old, and I am currently uh, in prison. In March 2011, a young British pilot was arrested in Africa. David Simpson, who works for a safari firm in the Central African Republic, called in the police after finding 18 mutilated bodies in a remote village. Are you telling me no, I didn't do it? Mom and Dad, I'm going to be arrested for mass murder. I said, we'll get the fuck out. If you try to run away, we will shoot you and we will kill you. I'm going to die. Right now, people are fighting to get me out. They could end up bloody hanging him or something like that. The world is watching this, so this is why I am uh, putting this film together. March the 22nd, 2011. David Simpson was working for a safari company in the Central African Republic. He was six kilometers north of an illegal mine on the Ginginza River when he heard news of a horrific discovery. The description was five people laid on the floor. We didn't know what the actual situation was. I'm closer than anyone. I should go and check it out and see what the situation is. There was a lot of different thoughts going through my head. We walked into the gold mine. And I'm a little scared. Laid right at the beginning of the gold mine, it's six bodies all laid face down. It's two sticks laid on top of the bodies, which have been cut from the forest, surrounding forest, and used to beat them to death. The floor is all red, because they've had their heads beaten in. Blood is running across the, uh, across the whole floor. Seeing these dead people is horrible and, and thinking about what they went through. That is the worst thing, is thinking about what they went through more than, more than seeing them. It felt in a way that I just walked onto it and the, whoever had done this just walked off. Someone could have been watching us. I quickly grabbed hold of myself because I had to, because I had a team there. So I had to, I, you know, I had to be the leader. You know, I was in Africa for a bit of an adventure. Yeah, I was thinking, this is bad. This, this isn't good. I want to go home now. David! Oh, David! Before school, I would go and work on the farm. Then I would go to school got back home, I would work on the farm. On weekends, I would work on the farm. Mm -hmm. Get that first. Right. Hi, Captain. I think it really set me instead for the rest of my life because I, I really know how to work. That's me giving them his answer to Tom Crow's look here. <laughs> David grew up in the North Yorkshire village of Gillamore. It's a place where a lot of people are born and they go to school there, find a girl, get married there, and have their children there and never leave. In the village, there's about 17 of us, I think, all together. We aren't oogie feely close, it's, uh, but, you know, if you cross one of us, you cross us all, sort of thing. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And that was the big thing, you know. 
We went to a wedding. <laughs> and my dad was pointing out the gravestones. And there's your great uncle. Da -da -da. I just thought I don't want to be another one in this graveyard. I always wanted some adventure. I don't want to be another Simpson that's never been anywhere. We were sat here, we were watching a programme on telly and it was about a safari company. And he said, I wouldn't mind doing that. I said, oh, knock yourself out, go off, go for it. I'd read quite a, quite a, a lot of books and, uh, and things on, on Africa and, you know, the old tales of Livingston and Stanley. I just needed to do something different. I needed to get away. If you're looking at the African map and put your finger right in the what you think is the middle, that's where you'll be. And you could call it the largest remaining wilderness in the world. Eric Morave runs a 20 million hectare safari concession in the remote northeast of the Central African Republic. We started this up together uh, from the very beginning. This is me and Eric and his little sister and my little sister in the village where we grew up. Eric's always been the hunter. I didn't know anything about hunting. I knew the country, I knew the language, I knew people, I knew those kind of things. We're specialized in exclusive wilderness safaris. Yeah, it's a female. These are really exclusive animal species, which you don't find anywhere else. Since they set up in 2007, international big game hunters have come here to turn some of the most rare and beautiful animals in the world into trophies. Very, very happy with him. He's, he's absolutely gorgeous. In late 2010, David arrived in Central Africa to take up a job with Eric and Emily's safari company. It was a bit mind-blowing initially. I just rolled around, I was looking out the window the whole time. Eyes wide open. Since gaining independence from France in 1960, Central Africa has endured decades of unrest. Armed rebel groups roam throughout the country. It is dangerous, it is AK-47s, it is starving children, it is uh, lions trying to eat you alive, it is uh, people trying to shoot you everywhere. Everything around Central African hunting and working is tough. To be honest, the thing that scared me the most, it wasn't the scary animals, the scary people, it was would I be capable, would I be good enough of this, and what would I do if I wasn't? I would be given jobs, same jobs that like the Africans were doing. I mean, it wasn't anything more taxing than pick this up, move this there, cut this with a machete, which I was terrible at. I'm eating this really bad food, sleeping on a plastic mat on the floor with ants crawling all over you. It was horrible, it was horrible. So at that time I was thinking, oh, I want to go home now, you know, go back to what I know, it's easy and, you know, I, I know it and I'm comfortable there. But, you know, I made myself stick it out and I said, I'm going to stick this out, I'm going to stick it out and I'm glad I did. Eric really tested me. He showed me on the map, I think this area's got a lot of animals in it. I want you to go in there, build the road and then build a camp in this area and you are... Uh, responsible for it all. And he gave me 40 workers. You're, you're the boss of them. Go and do it. It 
it's strange being the only white face around and things like that. That is a strange, a strange thing. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I didn't really. I didn't really. It was more the language than than being, you know, the only white face in a, in a sea of uh, of darkness. But not knowing the language was no obstacle to David's ambition. I did it, and I built 100 and, 100 and something kilometers of road in that two months, and I built a really nice camp. I think it's a dream a lot of people have, to go out into a wilderness and just survive. And not many people do it, and I could say, well, I did it. But the safari company's 200 kilometers of new road were about to open up the wilderness to less welcome visitors. David Simpson was halfway through his first season in Central Africa. He was cutting a new road when he discovered the safari company were not the only people working in the jungle. I hadn't seen any sign of any other people for months. And then all of a sudden, here's these three people. That was a bit of a shock, I have to say. I mean, I didn't know what they were doing. It took me a little bit to work out what they were there digging holes for. It wasn't until one of the guys explained it to me and then they showed me the gold. That's when I worked out what it was. They were digging gold. The men were from the village of Bakuma and were illegally prospecting on the safari company land. They knew they shouldn't be there. They knew it was illegal. They're very nervous. They don't know what I'm going to do. It wasn't really a problem. It was just three people. I gave them two options. I said they leave and they never come back, or they come and work for me. They were already in the bush. They got more money working for me. They got better rations, better food working for me, so they came and worked for me. So, you know, that first time was, I thought, was the best compromise. You know, I needed people. They were there. Okay, I gave them a job. At the end of his first year in Africa, David was promoted to general manager. With the safari season over, he came home to Yorkshire. I get back to my family and I try to explain and they don't understand that, like, the feeling that I have of really achieving something and, and I found that difficult. Oh. I felt it like it was a big rift between us two because I couldn't explain it to them. David was the one I always thought would join me in the business because uh, he always loved it, he just absolutely loved it. I got my first gun when I was 10. I think I shot my first pheasant when I was about 13 or something like that. And, you know, I loved it. Pheasants dominate everything. If I aren't rearing pheasants, I'm thinking about rearing pheasants. I rear pheasants from day old chicks up to seven, six and a half, seven week old, and then I deliver them to, to private shoots. Only thing I'm good at is rearing and killing things. I have no other talents whatsoever. In late 2011, David returned to Central Africa for a second safari season. It was immediately apparent that the miners from Bakuma had also returned. It was even more than when we were there in December. The choices of employment are either you work for the safari company, if you don't work for the safari company, then you're either a poacher or you, you dig gold. 
there's always a financer behind these mines. Somebody with a little bit of money. I mean, the equipment is very basic, unbelievably basic, but they can't afford that. You know, a normal person can't afford that. Someone had sent them to Prospect, I think that's what it was. Hey! I wanted to get rid of these guys hey, hey! and do it without a conflict. So what I do, which I think is a good thing, I just took their spades and their sieving equipment and things like that. We have a depot in Bakuma. And I said, right, it'll take you guys four days to get there. You go there, you say your name, and you'll get your equipment back. Because what you're doing is illegal. I think that caused a little bit of uh, bad feeling. But at that point, I was very hopeful that, you know, maybe this time something has worked. March the 22nd, I spent the night in the bush. I was marking up the road. The whole time I was within six kilometers of the gold mine. I was in camp, I was in Kosho main camp. And uh, I was just working, it was a regular day, I was just working. About three o'clock in the afternoon, I got a phone call from Eric and he says, Sinclair, who is the camp manager of Bonga, has found five bodies at the gold mine. There are people telling me, told me they're dead people there, but I don't believe this. But go there, at least tell me what it is and what they've seen. I don't know, so that I can really know what, they, what has really happened there. So what I said to Eric is, well, I, I'll go there and check it out. And I couldn't really think what would happen. It was a shock, I mean, it's horrible. Everybody was freaked out and I was, I included, but I mean, I didn't, I was freaked out, but I had to be the leader, which is a, which is a hard thing in those situations. David discovered that there were in fact six dead bodies at the mine. While we're there, we hear voices. get a little bit nervous. I don't know what the voices are. And it's four people who have just come to start mining the gold. And I say, right, it's too dangerous to, to stay here. You four people, you, you'll come back to the camp with me and then we'll get you back to the village. They all agree. But the fourth guy, he says, I need to go and get my stuff, which I left just in the forest over there. Hey. Hey. And he doesn't come back. After half an hour, the fourth miner had not returned. We're worried that he's been taken. We, we never found this fourth man. We never found it. Eric reported the discovery of the bodies to the police in Bakuma and arranged to meet with David and the Central African military at the scene of the massacre. So I lead them down there, I show them the six bodies. Bodies are starting to decompose and the smell is horrendous. So they go around taking photos on a mobile phone. Uh, and that's what they do. They take photos of all the bodies. I recognize three other people in there as well. They'd been working for me previous years. My first initial thought was, oh, who could have done this? Why? And then I say, we need to check the gold mine. That was my first thought when I got there. I said, we need to go down there and check the rest. 
So we go up the hill just behind their camp and we find four dead bodies. And these are tied together, all laid face down, tied together with their arms behind their back. The wind is coming from one direction and I get out of the wind so I can't smell the smell anymore but I can st still smell a, a dead flesh smell. And I said, there's more bodies. And I said that with the military guys around. I shouldn't have said that. They're taking it, I know the crime scene, I know where everybody is. Just meters away, they find three more dead miners. And then the military commander says, it's too dangerous to be here, we need to leave. I couldn't believe it. I was expecting them to take the bodies away. I was expecting them to identify the bodies. I was expecting them to do a proper search of the site. Uh, I was expecting more. After just 30 minutes, the authorities leave the murder scene. They never identified the bodies. They didn't bury them. They didn't do anything. You know, it's I, I, that was the most upsetting thing for me is how little people cared. In Bakuma, news of the massacre sparked a violent reaction. Within hours, the villagers' grief turned to rage. The target of their anger, the safari company and its depot. They got a telephone call from Bakuma, where they called me and said, we have a riot here tearing down everything we had there and looting everything. And at this stage, David, David is flying towards Bakuma. I think in this whole thing, that's the time when I was the most scared. And we tried to call David on the radio for half an hour and didn't get an answer. It was only when David landed that they got through. So I pick up and he asks, uh, where the effing hell are you? And I said, well, I'm in Bakuma. I said, what the beep beeping the hell are you doing there? Get the hell out of there now. I'm like, what, why? What's... This is the people of Bakuma is rioting. And as I was saying that, I'm hearing gunshots going off in the town. You know, I said, okay, I'm, I'm gonna get out of here as fast as I can the fastest takeoff I've ever done. As I'm taking off, people are running on the sides of the airport. I don't know whether they would have killed me or just beaten me to death. I overflew the town and I saw our depot and our truck on fire. I'd worked in Bakuma for nearly two years. You know, we were employing a lot of the young men of Bakuma. As I saw it, we had a very good relationship with them. How do you feel being a, a figure of hate for sort of a hundred angry people? It was, it was shocking. It was so shocking. But the villagers had cause to riot. The fourth miner had arrived in Bakuma. He arrived back in the middle of the night exhausted and telling everybody, I saw David Simpson stood over the bodies, beating them to death. Hard on the heels of the fourth miner, the police and military had returned from the massacre. And they said, yes, it makes sense because David showed us where all the bodies were so it must have been the white people from the safari company. To have them think that I, it, 
even possible that I could have done this. I just felt that this is going to be a bad time. The allegations against David and Eric spread far beyond the village. Central African Republic Radio had already named them as suspects in the massacre of the miners. Three days after discovering the scene of a massacre in Central Africa, safari worker David Simpson and his boss found themselves prime suspects in the murder of the 13 miners. I was in Bangui, the capital, and I heard that there had just been this massacre. Ida Sawyer was researching human rights abuses in the Central African Republic. It sounded suspicious, um, and it, one of the largest single killing incidents in CAR in the last several years. And it wasn't clear yet what had happened. Determined to investigate the killings, Ida traveled to Bakuma with a Central African military escort. It was still fairly tense. There were lots and lots of rumors. Everyone had heard about it. The initial suspicion was that the white men had just carried out the massacre. One incident in particular had cast grave suspicion over the role of David in the massacre of the miners. We tried various things to get rid of the miners. They kept returning. I managed to get hold of some plastic skulls, which were actually should have been used in a, in a fish tank. They were half-sized, tiny uh, skulls. I knew how superstitious uh, Africans were, and I, I, I thought this would maybe just be enough to scare them off. It was just, I, it was a desperate attempt to try to stop this influx of these gold miners. We said, we've just done a magic, uh, a magic, white man's magic, and this, has made all the gold disappear in this gold mine. Who came up with the idea of using magic? It was my idea. Probably not a good idea, but it was my idea. I met one of the men who was in this group, and he said, David Simpson showed him three small skulls. If they didn't leave, they should be warned about what could happen to them. Whether it's witchcraft or, or not, it's, it, it, can, it was interpreted as a threat. A lot of people said, look, there was a warning, and now they've, they've carried out a massacre. With the safari company being accused of murder, Eric went to the capital to tackle the allegations head on. My idea was evidently to go down and really sort of start to explain things. Well, he was arrested, so that didn't go well. With Eric in jail, David was now summoned to the capital for urgent questioning. They were asking for me, all these 10 days, they were asking for me to turn to they wanted me to come in. We were having a family dinner and we were all sat around here when David rang up and he said, Mum, Dad, uh, I'm going to be arrested for mass murder. Um, I, I told him, I said, well, get the fuck out. Get out of the country. Go, come home just jump in the plane and piss off. We'd have got him back some more. Eric gave me a chance to do what I wanted to do in Africa and, and 
then to to leave him to that, that would have been, I, could, I don't think I could have lived with myself after that. In one way, I respect him. In another way, I think he's a dickhead. But um, it would have made me feel a lot better if he'd just come home. We were being accused of mass murder. And then I run away, I leave the country and I leave Eric there to take the rap for it. That would have really not worked, would it? On April the 4th, 2012, David went to the capital and turned himself in. I was taken into a room with two guys, one young guy and uh, one older guy. I was playing solitaire the whole time on the computer. When I was questioned, and I was asked, did you do this? Did you, because the way they phrase it, did you kill 13 people? Everybody says you killed 13 people, so did you do it? I mean, it just, what, it's just so ludicrous, you know, I laugh. A lot of people have said that my humor that I see in this situation is inappropriate, but it's my situation, and if I find it funny, then I think that's okay, isn't it? After a six hour interrogation, David was taken to the same holding cell as Eric. To be honest, I was thinking a few days till everything got cleared up. Well, tomorrow makes it to three days, three days makes it into four days. So once it got past the two weeks mark, I think I was thinking, this is okay, this is bad. This, this isn't good. David and Eric were held without charge for over a month and a half. Then a government official came to them with a remarkable offer. He tells us this can all be over very quickly if you pay 20 million Central African francs. We discussed this, is this the way to go or should we do this? One, we don't have any money and two, even if we only have a, a, a cent, we would not give it to you. Having refused to bribe their way out, and with the investigation going nowhere, Eric and David started a second month in the holding cell. I was a little bit worried. How much of my life am I gonna lose in here? The family of a British pilot who spent more than six weeks in an African jail have accused the Foreign Office of doing too little to help him. David Simpson, who works for a safari firm in the Central African Republic, called in the police. They've lost track of days, really. I thought that it would probably be held, but I thought it would all be sorted in a couple of weeks. Everybody did. This bloke at Foreign Office was on and he was saying, oh, I understand your pain, Mr. Simpson. I said, you understand, fuck all. I just want to go across and... It's, it's stressful, very stressful. Don't speak the language. So it was the best thing that we could do was be here and just, just wait for him to come home. We were expecting to be released at that point. You know, we were thinking this, we're going to be released somewhere here. You know, what's going on here? After one and a half months in the holding cell, David and Eric were formally named as suspects in the massacre of the miners and taken to jail. I was not expecting that. It was threatening. People knew who we were and knew what we were there for and they thought we did it. Guards knocked us around. We are taken to the commanders of the prison's office. And he says, you are very bad people. I know what you've done, I've read what you've done. You are very, very evil. If you try to run away, we will shoot you and we will kill you. A few people have hated me in the past, but never so intense and, and so many.
the days were so long. The days were so, so long. So it's lunchtime and we're having our one meal a day. And this is what we eat, gozo, this sticky stuff from the mania crude. I can't do anything and I'm sat on my backside. I was so mad and so angry. Then I started to struggle to cope with the situation. There was a time in the prison where there was not enough food because the, the prison had run out of money. People were desperate. They were all thieving badly anyway, but it, it took it to the next level. Some guys they were giving me hassle and, and these guys I knew had stolen from me before. That's right, move out the way. He wouldn't move. I was thinking, you know, I'm gonna get really badly beaten up here. And then he pulls out a knife. I'm gonna die, I was thinking. And I hit him in the chest. I grabbed one of the other guys. And then I, I hit him in the side of the, the arm. And the other two, they ran away. I could have been in trouble there. Uh, I, was, I was lucky. I was lucky. As David and Eric began a fourth month in prison, the truth about the massacre was about to emerge. On or around March 20th, 2012, a group of 13 men were killed in a remote area 164 kilometers northeast of the village of Bakuma. Four months after David Simpson and Eric Marav were jailed on suspicion of murder, Ida Sawyer published her report into the killings. Human Rights Watch researched the possibility that the camp's managers and staff may have been involved in the massacre. We didn't find a motive that was credible. Um, it, yeah, it just it didn't it didn't make sense to us that they would have wanted to kill in this horrific way the the gold miners. The methods used to kill the 13 men strongly resembled those used by a Ugandan rebel group, the Lord's Resistance Army. Based on our investigation, we believe it is very likely that the massacre was committed by the Lord's Resistance Army. Infamous for atrocities committed in Uganda, the rebel group were known to be active in Central Africa. But despite the Bakuma massacre bearing all the hallmarks of an LRA attack, Eric and David were still captive. No real evidence. There was a lot of people saying that you did it, but there was no evidence. There is just rumors. Rumors, and they can live on rumors as long as you don't, as long as you don't take it to court, because when you take it to court, you're going to have to prove evidence. This was the hardest time of my entire life. It was about one o'clock in the afternoon. The guy runs up to my cell and he says, oh, there's a riot going on outside. And I hear, I hear a lot of commotion outside. Then I see like all the prisoners have got out and then people are starting to come in. I mean, they were looting all the sleeping stuff of the, the prisoners. They took electric cable off the walls, light bulbs. So I'm like, oh, this could be bad. They're like, give, give, me, give me the bedding, give me this. And okay, well, and they had machetes, take it. There's a woman that grabs me initially and I tried to pull away from her and she swings at me and uh, she caught me right on the chin end and it just, it swung me to my knee, it dropped me to my knees. How can I be in like the space of a few months, be in two riots 
like a knife, attacked with a knife, you know, find a massacre site. What, what has just happened to me? Yeah, I actually heard from the Foreign Office. I'm not alarming you, Pete. I don't want to alarm you. He said, but David's safe, but he said there's been a riot in the prison. That, I can't get my head around that at all. I just can't. Who in their right mind would, would raid a prison and loot a prison? You'd just think, pinch the prison gates. Pinch the bloody gates. With the prison unable to house them, David and Eric were placed under house arrest at the Safari Company compound. Here is the sound of uh, incarceration in uh, Central African Republic. Go. No, it felt great. It felt great. Proper hot shower was amazing. Uh, and then we had pizza and, and wine. And I was, I was just, I was, I thought I was in heaven. But while the investigation continued, Eric and David were still suspect. The judge gets back and he tells it. He tells us there is no evidence. Now it's just a matter of doing the paperwork. But then the judge is ill, and he's ill for a month. A fucking Central Africa. God, it makes you so. Just gets you pissed off sometimes. We're told we're innocent, we're told we're going to be cleared, but it just didn't happen. Hi, David. Any news? No news. They haven't got off the charges. So you've not heard anything at all? He's still a suspect. And if they could get him back in prison, they probably would. We want you home, David. We aren't bothered about that. You're just waiting. We're just... And that's harder than, than it was before. So will you, will you promise to ring us as soon as you hear something? He's got tickets booked, but he's not coming home. And that's where we've been now for the last three weeks. Look what I just got. Alleluia. Alleluia. Mercy and Zappa. Mercy and Zappa. It's great. I have my passport. With a visa. With a proper visa. Everything is good. I am getting on the aeroplane and I am leaving. After five and a half months as a murder suspect, David Simpson was coming home. There was cameras everywhere and uh, it felt a little bit surreal, you know. Everybody wanted something from me. I just wanted to get on with life. We, we don't, we don't hug. We don't, we don't hug, hug normally. Um, lose your hair out your eyes, darling. <laughs> okay, that was the weirdest thing I've ever done. Sorry. <laughs> it's like, I'm sort of an outsider coming back to our culture. That was a strange thing, because I never had that perspective before. It's a very strange thing to have a new perspective on something that you've known your whole life. This is what I wanted to give you all. I love Central African Republic. I've seen the best, and I've seen the worst of it, and... Uh, Somehow I still want to go back there, and it's hard to explain to anybody. Why the hell should I go back? If you think about it logically, it looks totally crazy. 
but I love doing what I'm doing. I love the country. I'm going back in a month. <sighs> Sorry, Mum. A very decent of you, son. Yeah, great. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, really impressed, yeah. I've seen people giving up on Africa, and everybody gives up on it, especially Central Africa. But I don't want to be another person that gives up. He'll do what he wants to bloody do, won't he? We'll just pick it up when he gets back, we'll sort it out, whatever happens. I would hate him to be here and miserable and to blame us for stopping him doing what he wants to do. And I don't think we can do that. I don't think anybody can do that to their children, really. Maybe it's not a huge difference and maybe I'll fail trying to make things better. I think I can do something, we'll see. In November 2012, David Simpson returned to the Central African Republic. He continues to work for the safari company. To date, no one has been brought to justice for the massacre of the 13 miners from Bakuma.